All right, we are in part five of our series, God's Plan A, Our Plan B. And then this, after, once we got through Thanksgiving, this turned into our Christmas series, and we'll wrap it up next week with part six, and then we'll kind of celebrate uh, the fulfillment of it at Christmas Eve service on the 24th. Uh, and we'll have a big camping and candlelight service that night. <coughs> Excuse me. So just to recap parts one through four, in case you missed them or forgot or weren't here, uh, we chose to define, we looked at the fact that in the Garden of Eden, it wasn't that God gave Adam and Eve a rule that they broke, and because they broke the rule, he got mad that they broke the rule and doomed all of humanity. We looked at the fact that what Adam and Eve did in the Garden is that they took for themselves who would decide what was good and bad? Who would decide between right and wrong? And rather than accepting God's view of what's right and wrong, they decided to, to make their own, to set their own standard of right and wrong based on what they felt and what they saw and what, the, what looked good to them. And we saw Eve looks at, look at the fruit and say, it looks good. Even though God has said, it is not good for you. You should not eat this. It will kill you. You will die. But Eve decided it was good and took it for herself. And ever since then, we as a human race have been busy trying to decide for ourselves what's right, what's right for me, what's good for me, based on, well, what we feel, what we see, how we perceive things, rather than letting God set that. And that that disrupts all of our relationships, and it disrupts our relationship with God and separates us from God, and we call it sin. So then in part two, we talked about that now, because of that disruption in the relationship, that now we tend to want to relate to God through rules. And we see the Bible as a rule book. And so we say, okay, God, just tell me what to do. Just tell me, you know, what, what, can, I, what can I do, what I, what I have to do, and I'll kind of follow that, and then I'll be, I'll be okay, I'll be my own person. And that God does not want to relate to us that way, that he gave us the Bible to give us wisdom so that we would understand and see things his way. And it's not about following rules, it's about learning to see life the way God sees it. In other words, what he wanted Adam and Eve to do, which was to learn his way of thinking rather than our own. And so he teaches us wisdom. And of course, that involves being in a relationship with him. But we talked about that we still, we want to focus on our performance, and we also focus on the outward appearance. We focus very much on, on we want to look good, we want to... You know, if we're not there yet, we want to at least look like we're there. And so we, and we talked about especially that has become a, a key part of church culture in that we walk into church and no matter what kind of week you had at church, everyone's doing great. You know, and the marriage is great, the kids are great, I'm great, everything's great. And we, we dress up the outside and, and try to cover the inside and say, hey, how you doing? Praise, I'm doing great, praise the Lord. When oftentimes that's just not true. But we feel like we're supposed to be there, so we pretend we're there. And we talked about that that is not what God wants. And that God is not focusing on the external. That's us. And the Bible tells us that's us. Man looks on the outward appearance. God looks on the heart, the inward. And God wants us to change on the inside. And actually, it does not that he wants us to change. He wants to change us. He wants to change us on the inside. And then that will flow out of us and change the outside. And then last week in part four we looked at the fact that part of our problem is that this outside, this body that we own, that is us, is weak, that the flesh is weak, and that I am in constant war with it because this body is adapted to life here on earth. It's adapted to a life of serving itself. And we saw that when Jesus was on earth, he was tempted to serve his body, and that that ways are not always morally sinful, as in, you know, breaking some sort of commandment, but it's still following the flesh, following this weak body. And that God is eventually going to give us, as he's already given to Jesus in the resurrection, a new body that isn't setting us up for failure and setting us up for death. And so in the meantime, we need to treat our body as, as dead. And that's tough because it fights for life. So after all this, this is what we've talked about. But even after four weeks of studying this, if you're anything like me, and I'm betting you are in some ways, because I think that I'm, while weird, not that far out of the norm, what do we still ask ourselves? Am I doing this right? Am I doing this right? Am I doing okay? 
Now, even after we learn all this, that's still a question in our heads. And we still, even if we know better, we still feel like we're getting it wrong. Or that we, you know, I need to, I need to step it up. I need to, I need to try harder. I need to work harder. And the problem is, is because of that constant feeling, after a while, that just gets, gets discouraging. Because you're like, I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying so hard. And you always feel like you should be trying harder. Because we're still focused on our effort. And so we want to look today at a little more of that. So let's pray and then dive in. Good morning, Father. Lord, as we open your word once again, as we try to understand what it means for you to come to us, for you to be the God who came to us, Emmanuel, God with us, the God who came down and lived with us as we celebrate this month, as we focus on you coming to us and you dying for us and living for us and calling out to us and loving us. Lord, for us to try to get around ourselves and understand you and what you've told us in your word and what it means for us to receive you. Lord, I just pray you'll help us understand your word this morning. You'll help us see what you're saying and hear your voice and understand what it means for us to really respond to you and be with you as you came to be with us. So help us as we study your word now. Help our minds and hearts absorb and respond to you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn to Romans 5. As I was putting this together, I struggled a little because there's so much good stuff in here, and yet we just can't do it all in one message. You wouldn't enjoy that because it would get too much. So we're going to do five through. We're going to do one through eleven as our starting point for today. Romans five one through eleven. I'll read that. If you'd like to read along in your translation, uh, just follow along. Romans five one through eleven. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, though, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we exult in hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man, someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than Having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. There's a lot in just that part. So we have to start with the very first verse here. It says, therefore, having been justified by faith. And we really need to understand what the writer means when he says we have been justified by faith. Because it's a very specific meaning of what God has done for us. <clears throat> but sometimes people use the memory peg that to be justified means that you've been made just as if I've never sinned. And that's, that's one of those clever little memory pegs that is not terribly accurate. It's not wrong, but it's not right enough. What justification means, if you, if you don't know, some of you probably know, but some of you may not, that what justification means is that what Jesus did, what God did through Jesus, because Jesus is God, what happened to you was that not only did by him dying on the cross, not only did he wipe out your negative record, wipe out the things you had done wrong, all the ways that you have violated who you ought to have been as a child of him. Not only did he wipe that out, it is not merely that now you have a clean slate, 
If I'm in debt and my debt is wiped out, I have a balance of zero. You know, the slate is blank. That is not justification. That's half of justification. Then he also, because Jesus, before he died, he lived. And in living, he lived the perfect life. He never messed up. He was pleasing to God. He always did the right thing. He did a lot of really good things. Jesus racked up a positive balance, and the other half of justification is that that balance is now on your account. And so when, Jesus, when God looks at your life, he just doesn't see someone who didn't mess up. He sees someone that did everything right. You have a positive balance. That's justification, where you have now been deemed to not just not be displeasing, but to be fully pleasing. And that's a much bigger idea. I have, and that's why it says, I've been made righteous. I've been made good. You say, well, Larry, you're not good. No, I'm not good at all. Not myself. I'm just not capable of goodness. I'm too, I'm too selfish. I've, even when I do the right thing, half times I do the right thing for the wrong reasons. And yet I have been given credit as if I got it right every time. That is what he's talking about here. And so then everything else in here says, now because of that, because verse 1 says, therefore, since you've been made acceptable to God, since you've been made pleasing to God, how does that affect your life? And he says, well, first, verse 1, he says, you have peace with God. You and God are okay. God's not mad at you anymore. You're all set. He's not looking at you kind of going, oh, you better watch it, dude. No, you're good. Verse 2, he says, you've received grace. What's grace? Favor you didn't deserve. In which we, it says, stand. What's my standing with God? How, do God? how does my relationship with God sit? I'm good with him. I stand in grace. And see, right there, we could, I could we just end the sermon right there. Which some of you guys be like, hey, amen, hallelujah, let's go. Because what is our biggest problem? So much of the time, you constantly feel like you're not good enough. You constantly look at your Christian life and go, I really should be doing better. And we walk around like we got a ton of weight on our shoulders spiritually because we're like, you know, I'm really not what I ought to be. And, oh, I really blew it this week. And I, I really should do more. And you feel like that's God's view of you. But God's view of you is, no, your standing with him is good. You say, but I had a rotten week. Yep. But you've been justified through Jesus, not through having a good week. Verse 3 through 5, it says, and therefore we deal with life differently. It says not only this, but we exult in tribulations. That's when the bad things happen. That's when the storms hit, when you get pushed back. And so when things are tough, he says, we celebrate those. I don't, half the time. I don't, like, I don't like tribulations. Who does? But if I remember that my standing with God is secure, not based on what kind of week I'm having, but kind of what weeks he had, now when those tribula tribulations come, it says, oh, I can appreciate them. Why? How do I appreciate them? Because I know it says that that tribulation brings about perseverance, meaning I don't give up. And I don't give up because I'm trying hard. I give up because he already tried hard for me. And that perseverance brings forth proven character. It changes who I am. It brings something new out in me that I don't manufacture. It creates it. Because now I learn to stand on his own two feet. And that new character brings forth, what does it say? Hope. Because now I know I'm okay. Now I not have to worry about you. When I get to the end, will God accept me? No, I'm good. This is temporary, and I know how it ends. And that hope will not disappoint me. And how, do, how, the, how will that hope not let me down because I've been so good? Because I've been such a great example of a Christian? No, what does the text say? Verse 5, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out to you. Through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. And so what I'm counting on won't disappoint me, not because I've done such a good job, but because he did such a good job. The love of God has been poured out. I have been given the love of God. I've been given the Holy Spirit. The gift of God is eternal life, not of works, but because I accepted his work. 
because I'm justified, because God now has accepted me, not because I'm such a great person, but because God was such a great person. And then just in case the people he's writing to miss that, he, verses 6 through 8, he reiterates why, because he understands that we are constantly feeling like, but I don't deserve it, but I've not been good. And so all the way through here, he's trying to say, listen, listen, yes, I know, I know you feel that way. Verse 6, while we were still helpless, at the right time Jesus died for the ungodly. And he says, you know, there, a, a human might die for a good person. There are times when pe people will lay down their lives if it's worth it. He said that Jesus laid down his life for bad people. Jesus laid down his life for people that didn't inspire self-sacrifice. God demonstrates, verse 8, God shows, demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, when we were not good people, when we were not okay and not pleasing, he died for us. He says, therefore, verse 9, if he was willing to do that when you were scum, why are you now worried about how he's going to treat you? Having been justified, having been made okay by his blood, not by your behavior, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. And then he says it again, verse 10. For while we were enemies, we were reconciled, brought into right relationship with God, through the death of his son. Much more, since you've already been made right, we shall be saved by his life because he lived the right life. And so then he wraps up this part by saying, and not only this, but we exult in God. We celebrate what God has done through Jesus, through whom we have now received reconciliation, being made Jesus did it, not because we deserved it, but because he loved us. We're saved from wrath. Let me say it again. Jesus died. God acted while we were against. And so often we think our Christian life is we do something, and if we do something, God responds. If I pray, God will. If I do this, God will. If I do this, God will. But the Bible, and through this passage explicitly, it says God did, and now you respond. God initiates, you respond. Not you do something, and then if you do it, God will go, oh, okay. No, God has already done it. He did it before you even were capable of understanding what he was doing. He did it. He initiates. And so we exult. Now, we didn't read on, but let's just grab a little bit more before he goes from there. Verses 12 through 18 he then recaps the idea of the two Adams that we talked about last week. That the first Adam messed up. He did his own thing. But the second Adam, Jesus, he made up for that. He fixed it. He corrected what went wrong by dying for us. Since Adam didn't obey, and Adam represents us, Jesus came and said, I'll obey for you. I'll do it for you. I'll take care of all this for you. And then he says, after reca recapping that again in verse 21, he says, so even though sin, doing our own thing, reigned in death, even so grace, God's goodness given to you undeserved, grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So now what's ruling my life? A fear of God, a fear of now living up to what he's done for me? No. What reigns in my life, what rules in my life now, it says is grace. You know what runs my life? God's favor that I don't deserve. That's what's supposed to control me. That's what's supposed to run my life every day is grace. What God gave me that I don't deserve. Jesus gives you your life because God gave you Jesus. And he gave you Jesus' record. And you now stand before God and you look just like Jesus did now. That's why it says we have now been given the privilege of being called his children. Because you look just like him. 
look just like him. So what does that mean? How do we understand this? What does it mean for us? Because we've talked about this. What am I constantly still asking? Am I doing this right? Am I, am I, am I okay? Am I, am I good enough? Am I being the right kind of Christian? Am I living up to what I'm supposed to do? And as Christians, we are so often feeling like we are under great pressure and great obligation. And God and godliness becomes a weight and a burden. Oh, it's so hard. I'm trying so hard, but no matter what I do. And, it's, and then at one point you do, it's one of two things. I try so hard, but whatever I do is not good enough for others. They're always judging me. Or it's not good enough for me. I'm always judging me. And you've correctly diagnosed the problem. Everything you do is not good enough. You're right. That's a correct assessment. The problem is, is you're busy assessing what you've done, not what he's done for you. Your eyes are firmly planted on yourself. And so God and godliness becomes a weight and a burden, and that is a lie and a deception of Satan. That is a lie and a deception of Satan. And we feel this way because we are so still focused on the outward, on the outside of the cup the outside of our lives, what, look, what we look like, what we do, our work. And so what, what's the word we most often, I think, use? I should. It's funny. When people get around pastors, they get really uncomfortable. And one of the biggest things when I run into people and they find out I'm a pastor, one of the biggest words that starts coming out of people's lou- mouths is a sentence with the word should in it. Oh, hi. Hi, Pastor. Yeah, I know. I should go to church more. I should. Or they, you know, they say a word. Oh, pardon. I, I shouldn't. I shouldn't. I should not. I should. I shouldn't talk like that. I shouldn't. I shouldn't. I should. Right? And so wait. After a while, they don't want to hang out around me because I'm, all I represent is a great big pile of should. And that's a drag. Which is why I don't like to tell people I'm a pastor because, you know, you can see the should hit. That's a pew. Like, oh, he's cool. I'm a pastor. I shouldn't have said that. I wouldn't have joked with you the way I joked with you if I'd known you were a pastor because I should not. And we're full of shoulds. There is no joy in I should. You will never find joy in I should. Because joy is found in he did. The gospel is, he did. Not I should. He did. If you read through the whole chapter of Romans 5, you will notice that the entire chapter only talks about what he did. We have received, we have been given. Jesus did this, God did this, Jesus did this, God did this. The whole chapter is about our Christian life, And it's totally focused on nothing we do and everything we receive and everything we've been offered and given and had done for. Because the good news is not what you need to do. The good news is what he already did for you. And we have this idea that Jesus came to fix my outside. Jesus came to make me a better person and fix my outside. And that's not true. He came to fill your inside. And we're so focused on our outside that we are weighed down by how weak this flesh is. And so I'm constantly trying to make something that can't do it, do it. And then I feel like a complete failure. And I am. Because the Word of God tells me I will never accomplish it here in my flesh. But He wants to give it to me And as I live in that, it changes my life. So if you're like, well, I've got a long way to go in my spiritual walk, you do not understand what God has done for you. Jesus did it. What does he say on the cross? It is finished. Finished. He's done it.
we're not really fighting, I think, a war against God so much as we are constantly fighting a war against ourselves. God is constantly trying to give me grace, peace, righteousness, holiness. He just wants to give them to me. I don't deserve them. I can't do anything to get it. I can't do anything to make it greater. I can't put on an overcoat and therefore suddenly look better to him. There is nothing I can do. And yet, rather than just accept what he gives me, I just keep trying to hold on to my self-effort. I'm stubbornly clinging to my pride and my ability to self-improve. Help me out a little bit, God, but I'll do as much as I can myself. God's like, you can't do anything. You can't do it, Iron. No, 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 God, I, I'm going to try harder. I'm going to make you proud. God's like, I'm already proud because I declared that I'm proud of you. Jesus has made me proud of you. So just relax and let's talk. I'll get back to you. I've got to take care of my self-will first. He's like, just stop. Just stop. I've taken, I'm done. We're all set. You have peace with me now. Stop. Let me do this work. No, I got it, God. I got it. I got it. It's coming. I got it. I got it. Biggest frustration of my life with four kids. Try to, try to dress a toddler who is ready to dress themselves but is incapable. <sighs> okay, let me help you with the buttons. I got it. No, you don't. And that makes them mad. I can do it. No, you can't. And I can already see that that button didn't go into that hole. So when you get to the bottom, we're going to have to start over. I've got it. I've got it. Oh, just, just let me do it. Right? How many of you have been here? Some of you will be here. <laughs> and that's me and God. I got it. I got it, God. Okay, just get it started, then I'll do it. And then we go, oh, the Christian. Oh, it's just God's, no, God's hard. God said, no, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. So when we connect, when we receive, when we open up, when we accept Christ's work, on our behalf. His salvation. His sacrifice. His work. Do you know what happens? You will start to experience joy. And a lot of Christians don't have much joy. We have a crushing sense of obligation and should. And your Christian life is a drag because it's so hard. I love one of my, one of my, I, I got a lot of favorite songs. So if you ever hear me say I got a favorite song, it's never the same one. It's because I have a lot. But one of the ones that Ken picked out this morning was the, was the, who the sun sets free there. Who am I? I am who you say I am. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I'm not who I think I am. I'm who God says I am. Based on not what I've done or how good I've done it, but based on how great he did it, what he did. That's who I am. I'm a child of God. And the minute that weight lifts, whew. Now, do you think I live in that every day? Oh, you better believe I don't. Because I'm better at staring at the waves than at Jesus. And so then I go, oh, and I get beaten down, and then I'm not as fun to live with. And so people say, oh, how, how, can I, how do I know I'm saved? How, how do I know if I've done it right? Well, if, you, if you're asking if you've done it right, then you're off to a bad start. But if you are blown away by how much God loves you, if you lay in awe of, oh my goodness, I'm okay with God. Wow! I had a rotten week, and he and I are still okay. Wow! And, you, and that fills you up, then you'll know. That does not require more effort. It requires more focus on him. More understanding of him, not a better understanding of you. In a minute, I'm going to ask the elders to come up, and we're going to light the third candle. I'll light the first two while I'm talking here. <coughs> the first candle we did was hope. 
that this cannot disappoint because we know where we're going. And not based on how well I do it, but the fact that it's already been done well. It's finished. Then we, we lit the candle. I'm doing these backwards. We lit the candle of preparation. And preparation sometimes involves a lot of tears. It, it, it's hard. Tribulation. It hurts. But it just, what does it do? It drives us into God. Say, because he is taking care of me. And that brings us to the third candle we're going to light here in a second. Joy. And we sing about at Christmas, joy. Right? Joy to the world. The Lord has come. What's so great about it? Why so much joy? Because the angel said, I have come to tell you about the Savior has come. He's going to take care of you. He will do the work that needs to be done. He will save you. I bring you great news, good news, of great joy for everyone. Today has been born the one who can take care of you, the Savior. He is going to do it for you. Isn't that good news? If you want to know that you're saved, it's not did you pray hard enough Pray the right words. It's do you understand this day that Jesus has done the work for you. And he has made you okay. He has made you acceptable to God. You and God are at peace. You say, but I had a bad week. Of course you did. And a bad week should convince you of more joy, not of greater guilt. Because a bad week will only reinforce to you how much God has done despite the fact that you don't deserve it. It will make you appreciate the grace of God more as you see how undeserved you are. And that will begin to transform you because next week you'll have a different kind of week if you are focused on Him. You won't have to try harder. You will find yourself changed. By the work of God. Elders, come up. The thing about joy is that it is pride crushing. Joy is pride crushing because this is not about you. I'm going to ask Rob if he will light the candle. And then I'm going to ask him to pray. And then we're going to sing our last song together. So this is the 